and uh, he's gonna tell us about uh, twisted holography. So I will just start the recording. Recording in progress. And please, Kevin, take it away. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to um, thank the organizers for the opportunity to give these lectures. Um, I'd also like to apologize that I wasn't able to make it in person. Um, I, I'd appreciate it if, uh, I'm not entirely sure the level and background of the participants. So I, I'd really appreciate any feedback about how fast I'm going and the level of the material. Uh, <clears throat> and interruptions are very welcome. So what I wanna talk about is, well, the title is Twisted Holography. So what I'll talk about is you know, based on work by, by many people. And, and it's a way to, similar to in Matthias lectures, Twisted Holography is a way of getting really sharp, exact results from a supersymmetric subsector of ordinary holography. In the thesis lectures, he's not considering a supersymmetric subsector, but there are also exact results. So let, let me remind you a little bit about the background. So the original ADSC of key correspondence, you know, we've all heard a great deal about it, but it's important to recognize that the original correspondence is still very much conjectural. Okay. So it's a conjectural duality between n equals four super Yang mills and type 2b supergravity on ADS5 times S5. So the reason one should view this as, as conjectural is that both sides of the duality are incredibly difficult to understand. So on the gauge theory side, N equals four super young males, we're supposed to be studying strongly coupled gauge theory. You know, strongly coupled, constructing rigorously, or in any sense, a strongly coupled gauge theory is probably the most difficult problem in mathematical physics. It's one of the Clay Millennium Prize problems. So this is really out of reach of any mathematical techniques. And on the other side of the duality, when studying type 2b string theory and ADS5 times S5, this is difficult for two reasons. If one wants to take the supergravity approximation, then we're studying quantum gravity. Quantum gravity is, of course, hard because it's not normalized and so ill defined at the quantum level. On the other hand, one might try to think of it as a string theory. String theories are the way of defining quantum gravity. But it turns out that string theory in ADS5 times S5 is also very challenging. The reason I don't want to get into, but it involves the fact that. This is a Ramon Ramon background. So, of course, people have done lots of checks and there's like very heroic, extremely difficult computations at both sides. So it's very plausible that this works. So, what I'm gonna talk about today is a subsector of all of this where both sides are really easy to understand and you can really get your hands on things and check things completely. So, precisely on both sides, we're gonna select certain states which are preserved by supersymmetry. Now on the gauge theory side, 
Well, why is that easier? We'll find it has no coupling constant. The gauge theory is basically free. It's, it's very, very simple. And on the gravity side, we find that the gravity side is, is a topological string, but it's also much easier to understand than the physical string. So in this context, in these subsectors, we can perform exact computations to try to match both sides. And as I mentioned, the ADS3 holography in Gabriel's talk is a, a different, not unrelated context where exact results can be obtained. So there might be some parallels with Matthias's talks. Let me zoom out a bit. I'll be able to, so you guys can see a little bit more of the text. Let, um, is this legible or is it too small? No, no, it's good. It's not too small. Can I, go look, can I zoom out a little more? Uh, I think maybe it's the good size. Maybe if you make it smaller, it would be a little bit too small. Right, I, I, yeah. I just didn't want to just kind of be scrolling too fast. Okay. So the starting point of all of this analysis of twisted supergravity is the concept of a twist of a supersymmetric gauge theory. This was introduced by Witten in the late 1980s, um, in pretty famous work in which he related n equals two gauge theory to, to the Donaldson variance of a poor manifold. So I'm gonna start by reminding you of how one builds the twist of a supersymmetric gauge theory. So the example we'll start with will be a four-dimensional quantum field theory with n equals two supersymmetry. So let me, let me remind you what it means to have n equals two supersymmetry. The group spin four is, well, an Euclidean signature, it's SU2 times SU2. So each copy of SU2 has its fundamental representation. And these are the two spin representations of spin four. They're of complex dimension two. If we have, <clears throat> and I, I'm going to use Penrose's notation for spinners. Spinners in S plus will have an index, a Greek index alpha, like this, and in S minus, they'll have a dotted index like that. Now, when we have an n equals two theory with n equals two supersymmetry, we're going to have two pairs of supercharges. Q alpha i, where i goes from one to two, and Q alpha dot i, where also i goes from one to two. So we should recall that the vector representation complexified vector representation is a tensor product of these two spin representations. So in Penrose's notation for spinners and gamma matrices, instead of having an index for vectors, we write a vector as having a pair of indi indices, one dotted, one on, one on dotted. So the x alpha alpha dot indicates a vector. Now the commutation relations with the super symmetry algebra is simply Q Q bar is delta j times translation in the direction of this vector. Okay, so what does it mean to twist?
if I have a theory with n equals two supersymmetry, well, I have two pairs of supercharges with this x, extra index i. And we want, so the super algebra has a symmetry rotating that index. It's an SU2 symmetry. It's called the OR symmetry. So we're going to assume that our field theory also requires the symmetry. So the twisting procedure says that we're going to change the spin of our fields by using the SU2 OR. Now recall that spin four is a product of two copies of SU2. So I'm gonna change the spin of the fields by instead of making SU2 act in SU2 plus act in the normal way, I'm gonna make it act via the diagonal map between, between the original SU2 plus and the OR symmetry. So what does that mean? That just means that, whereas before I had an index i in my supersymmetry algebra, I'm now going to make that index transform onto the Lorentz group. So it transforms as the index alpha. So that, what do our supercharges now become? QI alpha becomes Q alpha beta, or again, alpha beta are now spinner indices, and Q bar alpha dot I becomes Q bar alpha dot alpha. We'll use that in a minute, but you notice that Q bar now transforms as a vector because it has two spinner indices of opposite elicities. So what this means is that because the I index now transforms as a spinner index, we can build a supercharge, which I'll just call a Q, which is a scalar. And it is automatic that in the supersymmetry algebra that this, this is a nilpotent supercharge. The reason is, well, if I take Q squared, the square of any supersymmetry is a vector, but this is also a scalar, so it must be zero. So the key point of the twisting procedure is that given the supercharge Q of square zero, we change the theory by replacing the original Hilbert space by the Q cohomology. So the twisted Hilbert space is defined to be those states which are in the kernel of Q modulo those which are in the image of Q. And we do this for everything else. We do this for local operators. Of course, if it's a CFT, that's the Hilbert space on the three sphere. It's a bit more challenging, but it is also possible to formulate this definition for extended operators. <clears throat> if one reads the older literature on twisting, Part which is really emphasized is the first step, this part here, changing the spin of the fields. But for me, I don't think that does very much. In fact, it does absolutely nothing. All that's happened is step one, when I've changed the spin of the fields, especially if I'm on flat space, is I'm just calling things by a different name. Instead of having an index i, I decide to call it alpha. I still have the same number of fields. My Hilbert space is still the same. My Hamiltonian is the same. I have all of the complexities are there. However, step two, 
where I've replaced my Hilbert space by the Q cohomology is a really radical simplification. And this is what allows you to do computations with the twisted theory. So, let's go. What I've described is the Donaldson Witten twist of n equals two supersymmetric gauge theories. And it turns out to be a topological twist. So let me try and explain what that means. Although maybe, unless anybody has any questions about the, about the material so far. Sorry, sorry if that was awkward. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. So, you have the index i for the SU2R and an index alpha for the SU2 plus. Why are you allowed to call them the same letter and then treat them as if they are in the same space? Because you take a trace at some point in defining Q, right? The scalar. Right. That's right. So what I've done is I've changed the way SU2 plus acts on everything. So the charge of SU2 plus is the original charge it had before twisting plus how it transforms under SE2R. So that's, um, let's scroll up a little bit. So I'm taking this step. So my new action of SE2 plus is the, act, the original action of SE2 plus, but then I embed it diagonally in the product of these two groups. Yeah, I see, I see. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so let me move to it. Unless there are further questions. Let me move to explaining what it means to be topological. So the hallmark of a topological theory is that the energy momentum tensor vanishes. So energy is the action of translation in time on the Hilbert space, and momentum is the action of translation in space. So let's explain why these operators vanish. When I twist my Q bar supercharges, the index I becomes an index alpha. So it looks like this, Q bar alpha dot alpha. So it transforms as a vector. And if one looks at the original commutation relations, we take our supercharge Q, call Q is like, like that. When I com commute it with Q alpha dot alpha, well, the only thing it can really become if it thinks that one thinks about the symmetry is the operator of translation by the space-time vector X alpha dot alpha. So what this means is that on the Q cohomology, this translation vanishes. So I didn't write out the equation that does that. Uh -huh. So if I take a state psi, which is Q closed, then it's derivative if I hit it with a translation in some direction, it's like this. Because here, if I'm the term where I move the Q past the Q bar is zero because Q psi is zero. 
and this is equal to zero in cohomology. So that's quite actually what this is for local operators. The same thing holds. If I have a Q closed local operator, then I, if I try to move it around, it's Q exact. So what this means, if I'm studying the correlation functions of Q closed operators, they're independent of where I put them. So let's see this explicitly. I'm assuming all my operators here, I'm assuming these guys are Q closed. And I differentiate with respect to the position of the first one. Now, I move the derivative inside the bracket and I replace it by Q, Q bar, get Q, Q bar of the first one there and then the other ones. And because Q is a symmetry, I can distribute Q over the other operators instead. But they're all, but they're all Q closed, so that's zero. So this is a summary of Witten's construction of the late 80s. That by performing this topological twist procedure, we find special operators have correlation functions which are independent of position. This is a very unusual feature, and it's a hallmark of having a TFT. Now, soon after Witten's construction, people thought about twists which were not topological. And that's going to be the focus of, of my lectures. So in the mid 90s, there was work by Johansson, Nekrasov, and others, where one studies um, the holomorphic twist of a theory with n equals one supersymmetry in, in dimension four. So this particular example is not going to really be the focus of, of these lectures, but I'm just going to spell it out to demonstrate how twists can have, can be holomorphic theories. Now, if one only has n equals one supersymmetry, then we no longer have the index i in the supercharges. We just have, uh, the supercharges are just consist of two spinners, one of each of So here, whatever we do when we twist, you can see it's not going to be possible for the twist to have the full spin four symmetry we started with. Whatever supercharge I select will break that. So we're gonna break the supersymmetry to SU2 minus. Where SU2 minus rotates the Q bar alpha dot and fixes the Q alpha. So I'll take my supercharge Q to be Q1, so just one of the two components of Q. And then I'm gonna write holomorphic coordinates on space-time by Z alpha dot is X alpha dot two, and Z bar alpha dot is X alpha, alpha dot one. These are So what's going on is that once I've broken the Lorentz symmetry group to SU2, that SU2 preserves a complex structure in space-time. Well, and here we can think about this should be a bar. 
the key thing we needed earlier was that Q, Q bar would give me all of the translations. Here, what we find is that Q, Q bar only gives you two of the four translations, those in the directions I call the Z bar. So now, what does this tell us? The same argument tells us that correlation functions are independent of Z bar. So D by DZ bar, say, over one, if I differentiate in the Z bar direction, first coordinate, by the same argument, I bring this inside, I replace it by Q, Q bar, and I move Q around, that's going to be zero. So the correlation functions are holomorphic functions of the position. So this equation here is, this is the cauchy green equation. So once spend some time, you know, it's interesting to, to study the behavior of these holomorphic twists. There's lots of fun things one can say about them. <clears throat> in general, the most general behavior would be something that's partially holomorphic and partially topological. But let's not get into that. This is mostly an example. Now I want to move to the kind of twists we're really going to be focusing on to do twisted holography. It's legible. Um, so I want to focus on a construction which seems a little odd at first, whereby one starts with a four-dimensional theory, an n equals two theory, which you assume is super conformal. And then you turn it into a two-dimensional chiral theory. So this is a little bit funny. It's a little bit of a, like a different thing than we did so far. There are two approaches to this. One is, which is perhaps well, the most widely studied, Instead of taking Q to be a supersymmetry, you take it to be in the larger algebra of the superconformal symmetries. And the second approach, which gives you the same answer, is to use a version of Nekrasov's omega background construction. Now, actually, I'm going to spend a bit more time in this one. So this, while well, Nekrasov did really uh, kind of s version of this, this particular omega background construction is due to uh, G1O and General Yagi. So this construction is a, is a bit more technical than what I've described so far. So I'm not going to give all the details. So mostly what I want to do is explain the answer. You give me an n equals two theory, we will be able to figure out what, what it's what the two-dimensional two Carroll theory is, and then we can do computations with it. So let's take an n equals two theory in dimension four. Actually, maybe I should uh are, are there any, any questions with you? Hi, I have some questions uh, from the beginning. I got a little bit lost. So by the twisting, do you mean working on the Q uh, cohomology of the Hilbert space? Yes. Working on the Q cohomology of the Hilbert space and the space of local law. Okay, and I think that uh, after that you mentioned that uh, after performing this twisting, we preserve a complex structure, right? Um, what does it mean physically? 
I think, I think it depends. So, so this was the case with n equals 1 supersymmetry. And the complex structure arises by noting that if I take correlation functions of Q closed operators, they only depend on half of the coordinates. So in Euclidean signature, they depend on certain complex combinations of the coordinates, which are called Z, and they don't depend on Z bar. So the complex structure arises just from that equation. Let's see. Does that, is that uh, helpful for you? Uh, yes, more or less. <laughs> and, well, uh, so the, um, the fact that our correlation function is holomorphic, is that a consequence of the twisting and a consequence of this preservation of the complex structure? Or aren't they related at all? They're, they're, let me see. they're related. It's a um, the preservation of the complex structure. The fact that spin four is broken to SU two. Maybe maybe we should put that aside for now. And then the, the most important thing is that the correlation functions are holomorphic functions. Mm. And that statement is just a formal consequence of the supersymmetry. It's just that d by dz bar is the commutator of q with something. Okay. So that's, that's all. OK, thank you. So in the n equal 1 example, uh, can you say in a few words what is the set of operators that you are left with? Because I guess it's larger than the Kara ring of the theory. Yeah, um, uh, let's say we start with, let me find some black paper. Um, okay, n equals one Carol multiplied. Then we're left with one bosonic field and all its derivatives in Z1 and Z2, and one fermionic field and all of its derivatives. So if you look at the index of this, these are exactly the states that contribute to the superconformal index. Like for, you know, this one gives you kind of product or one minus Q L, one minus Q L, so so um, this kind of thing. But you know, by looking at words in this field and its derivatives, if you take its character with respect to the group U2, which is a symmetry because it's conformal, you'll find it's uh, the standard index of an n equals one superconformal theory. I see. Thanks. So maybe this is a, a comment for the experts. I think this is really interesting because suppose you wanted to give a careful proof of cyber duality. What you really should be doing is looking at the states of the twisted theory and identifying all the correlation functions. That's kind of accessible, but also really not tri trivial at all. It's the kind of thing I think about David is looking at, looking at this kind of question. Okay. Okay, are there any more questions? So let me try to explain that this construction of Yankee and L. So here I wrote down the n equals two super, supersymmetry algebra again. 
And I'm going to do something a little funny. We're going to take Q, which does not square to zero, squares to a particular transformation. So I, I'm taking epsilon to be a small parameter. And I write my Q as a linear combination of like, the, like this. And if you see just by contracting the tensors, I think maybe the indices, my notation is not super clear possibly, but if you can just contract the tensors when you can be Q squared, you find that Q squared is epsilon times the translation. It's up, but if you look at the norm of this vector, you'll see it's epsilon times the space-like translation. So what we'll do is make this direction periodic. So really, uh, that kind of, we're working on this cylinder, just coordinates x11, x2, x11 dot, x22 dot, plus another plane, which has coordinates x12 dot, x21 dot. And it'll be important in a moment that here, d by dx12 dot is q exact. And this, this, this other plane will be where the chiral algebra lives. Oops. So I'm going to call x12 dot z, and it's a homomorphic coordinate on this plane. Okay, so the result is, okay, I'm going to take my cylinder here, and I'm going to fill it in so that it becomes a cigar. So at the tip of my, you know, my my cylinder goes along and the radius shrinks. I got this cigar geometry. And then the result is that, that your n equals two theory extends across the cigar in a way which still preserves the supercharge we're using. So if we do this, we can do the following trick. So above, we saw that Q squared was d by d theta. So that's rotation on the cigar. If I take an operator which is at the tip of the cigar, it makes sense to ask that that operator is rotation invariant. It's on charge under rotation. And on such operators, q squared is zero because q squared is rotation. So then we can consider the q cohomology of the S1 invariant operators at the tip. And this is going to be the chiral algebra. So what's important for this construction is that it doesn't make sense to move my operators away from the tip of the cigar. Because away from the tip of the cigar, Q squared is rotation, and there are no rotation invariant operators. So this is why we've effectively localized to a two-dimensional theory. Now, 
on the plane, which lives at the tip of the cigar. D by DZ bar is Q exact. So for the same reason we've had before, if I take, looks like this, by taking things which are at the tip of the cigar and at other points, di in the plane, then the z bar derivative of the correlation functions vanishes. As long as my operators I'm inserting are q closed and rotation in. So in this way, we have identified in our 40n equals 2 theory, it must be super conformal, something very familiar, a two-dimensional chiral theory, just like one might be familiar with from elementary studies of the bosonic string or something like that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, can you consider also extended operators on this cigar, like a line that wraps the theta cycle and so on? Did they give yes. you something interesting in the 2D or the... Yeah, that's a really good question. So if you, the answer is yes. Um, so what happens is, if instead of thinking about it as a 40 theory on a cigar, we'll compactify to a 3D theory, along that circle, the effect of 3D theory becomes topological in the bulk with a chiral non-topological boundary condition. But the, there are extended operators and these become the bulk operators in the 3D n equals four theory. From the 3D n equals four perspective, they're the ones which parameterize the Coulomb branch. So they're kind of subtle and you realize that their 40 uplift must be the tooth lines wrapping those, that cigar. Okay, thanks. Okay. So let me very briefly mention a different perspective. Perhaps it might've been better to explain this one, but. For my purposes, I, I kind of didn't want to get into that much detail about either way of doing it. I mostly wanted to say the answer. So the different perspective developed by Beam, Lemos, Fiendo, Pellers, Bristelli, and Van Ries, they say that instead of taking an ordinary supercharge, like we've been doing, they take a superconformal charge, which lives in this superconformal algebra, which in this case is PSU 2 comma 2 slash 2. Now, what they find, things in the superconformal algebra include rotations. So in their story, rotations in one of the planes will be exact. So that implies, if you think about it, that the operators that live in the Q cohomology only exist on a plane inside of O4. Just like we saw above, the operators only lived at the tip of the cigar. Then they take the Q cohomology and it's the same chiral algebra. This, this perspective was historically the first one on building the chiral algebra from n equals two theory. And there's a great deal of literature about it. So I'm sure people who are interested in it can find good things to read. But as I said, I mostly want to say, given n equals two theory, what is the algebra? So let me start on this. If we have a Lagrangian theory, then we can just write down the algebra completely explicitly. 
So we'll start with the simplest thing, which is an n equals two free hypermultiplier. One one has n equals two supersymmetry. Um, the smallest number of scalar fields one has is four. So I'll write them like this, phi i, phi bar i. And this notation is kind of selecting, is, is breaking the symmetry in some way. And the Lagrangian for the free theory is the simple form. Like this. Okay, so what do we get when we take the chiral algebra in the way I've just discussed, or at least a sketch? These four scalar fields of the n equals two theory become two scalar fields in the chiral algebra, beta one and beta two. Beta and the beta i's comes from the phi i's and the phi bars don't contribute. These are of spin half. So the OBE between the beta i's is beta i of zero, beta j of z, beta j of z, is epsilon ij times one over z. So it's a little funny because so the beta i's are bosonic, but the OBE is like that of free fermions. So this chiral algebra is called symplectic bosons because they're bosonic fields. Okay. Now, what happens for gauge theory? Well, the n equals two vector multiplet contribute some fields to the chiral algebra. And these are something that should be quite familiar to people who studied string theory. They're BC ghosts. Although in contrast to the BC ghosts of string theory, these are ghosts that implement gauge symmetry. They're not ghosts that implement the diffeomorphism invariance of the wall sheet. So the BC ghost consists of BN, which is a spin one field, and CA, which is spin zero, and these are both fermionic. They have the simple OB, the B times C is delta AB times one over Z. Same OB one finds in pre fermions, except they're spins one and zero. As in any ghost system, one has to add on the BRST charge and the physical Hilbert space or space of local operators will be the BRST cohomology. So here is the formula for the BRST charge. And again, you might be, it might remind you of something you've seen in the string theory literature, except it's a, a little simpler. And the final thing one wants to do is consider how to couple the matter contents to the gauge symmetry. So all we do is we add the fields from the matter to the gate from the gauge symmetry and <clears throat> build a BRST charge which forces gauge invariance. So for the matter, well, if I started with a single hypermultiplet, I would have two fields, beta one and beta two. 
So the, the most general picture is I should take my beta i, my matter fields, to be in a representation which is symplectic. So that means that I have some invariant tensor omega i j, which is anti symmetric. So <clears throat> I'll give you some examples later. Using the fact that G acts on the representation, we can build, build a current here. This is the current which generates the action of my gauge fields on the matter. And then we say the BRST charge is just that for the gauge theory plus the C goes to times the current. So we're running out of time. I want. Can we have? Yeah, we'll have time for questions. I think. Um, okay. So. What we find is this construction works. Right, the BRST uh, charge squares to zero. If and only if there's some trace identity, which is twice the trace in the adjoint representation, two of the algebra elements, is equal to the trace in the matter representation. So again, you might be familiar with such a computation from, you know, there's something like this in Polchinski. One more. In the bosonic string, here's T charge squares to zero, if and only if or the critical dimension, this computation is much easier. I'll give you the computation in just a sec. But it's the useful fact is that this is the same trace identity one needs to guarantee that a 40 n equals 2 theory is super conformal. Let me move down to do the computation. So from the gauge sector, we have this vertex. And I want to consider the OPE of this with itself. So there's going to be a contribution from tree level involving one wick contraction. This vanishes by the Jacobi entity. The one loop contribution looks like this. I'm going to have C fields on the outside, like that. Recall the legs correspond to a wick contraction. They connect to C and a B because the OPE of C and B is one over C. So let's compute this. So we might have a contraction like that, and a contraction like that. Because well, there's two contractions, I get one over z squared. A zero, c b z, and then let's include the the um, flavor indices carefully. There's going to be twice times the trace the joint representation p a t b. The factor of two is because B and C run around the loop.
So let's take this expression. We notice the C is fermionic. CA0, CB0, trace TA, B is equal to zero because this expression here is symmetric. So if we take the OB and expand in series, we find the first non-zero term looks like CA zero derivative CB zero to trace T TA to B. Now for the matter sector, it's going to be the kind of the same kind of calculation. The C ghost is going to couple to two matter fields. And we're going to do a weak contraction where all, all the matter fields are contracted. And we find 1 over z, ca del cb, that's traced in the matter representation, atb. And to be careful, this one came with a minus sign because they were fermions, and the other one comes with a plus sign. I take my BRST operator. This is as no O. If this condition holds. And final thing to ask, you might have, maybe I should have said this first, why does a pole in the BRST operator and the OPE of the BRST operator with itself have to do with um, the BRST operator and failing to be nilpotent? Well, if I compute the commutator of its interval, When I move the contours past each other, we'll pick up a term where one of them is integrated around in a little circle around the other. Like I said, it all goes around like that. And if, if we look on the right hand side of this expression, a first order pole in the OPE of the BRST operator with itself will contribute um, a term in the square of the BRST charge. So this is not equal to zero unless the trace identity holds. Okay, so I'll stop there. Okay, let's thank Kevin. Recording stop.